Research uh, Institute in Paris at uh, Le Cord Les Cordeliers. Uh, she has spent a number of years uh, concerning uh, vasopressin and hydration, and she will explain that to you. She uh, received uh, some prestigious awards, including uh, the uh, Berliner Award from the American Society of, um, uh, of, uh, of uh, Physiology, Physiology. Physiology and, and Biology. Uh, she took a PhD at uh, the Sorbonne, and she also received the Colliery Award from the French uh, National Academy of Science. So uh, maybe we heard about the ugly. Uh, now we are going to hear maybe about the beauty. Thank you, please. First, I would like to thank the organizers to, uh, for their invitation to speak in this meeting and to present some uh, synthesis, some overview about the possible uh, adverse effects of vasopressin and how to uh, inhibit them by either drinking more water or maybe using antagonists of vasopressin. Um, I'm going to bring you to Europe or America or Northern America, uh, temperate countries, so my talk does not concern uh, the um, tropical countries. Uh, I have no conflict of interest, and my talk will have three parts. Uh, let's, let me first explain you why there is some hyperfiltration in some cases, and it is related to the need to excrete the end products of protein metabolism, and this is done with some uh, attempts to use as little water as possible. You all know, of course, that one of the kidney's main roles is to excrete electrolytes and the soluble end products of protein metabolism. Uh, but when we eat carbohydrates and lipids, the end products are only CO2 and H2O. But when we eat proteins, they contain nitrogen, strong acids, and other substances which are excreted in the urine in the form of urea, ammonia, uric acid, creatinine, and so on, in addition to CO2 and H2O. So only proteins uh, provide a lot of substances that the kidney must excrete. And just urea itself, uh, the, the largest uh, end product of protein metabolism, makes up about 40% of all urinary solutes on a normal Western-type diet. It's much, there is much more urea in the urine than there is sodium or chloride or any other solutes. And uh, the fact that urea is often expressed in milligram per deciliter does not allow people to realize how much urea there is in the urine. At least that's what I think. And the all end products of nitrogen metabolism are toxic to some extent. Even urea has some toxicity, which is moderate and does not, uh, yeah, has not been uh, dramatic uh, in studies that, um, intended to demonstrate these toxic effects, but there is a number of, substance, a number of studies showing mild toxic effects of urea. And these end products of protein metabolism have a low concentration in the blood, probably because of this toxicity. It's three to seven millimolar per liter for urea, and it's less than 100 microliter for ammonia, uric acid, creatinine, and other substances. And comp compare that with 140 or 100 millimolar per liter for sodium and chloride. It's much lower. And because of the load we have to excrete every day, these end products need to be concentrated in the urine, far above their plasma level, up to 100-fold for urea. I am speaking of humans. It's even worse in rodents. And up to 1,000-fold for ammonia. So these substances are highly concentrated in the urine. Actually, the kidney is well suited for concentrating urine. There is a, a very exp um, complex... Um, uh, there are very specialized vascular beds to supply each uh, part of the nephron. 
and the kidney is able to accumulate solutes in the inner medulla so that water can be extracted from the collecting ducts uh, when vasopressin uh, makes them permeable to water. So the main hormone is vasopressin. Without vasopressin, there is a diabetes insipidus. Urine cannot be concentrated. Uh, we, we all, uh, excuse me, uh, high protein intake is a source of waste products that the kidney has to excrete and to concentrate, as I've told you. But it is well known from nephrologists that high protein diet induces glomerular hyperfiltration. And this hyperfiltration, the, the role of this hyperfiltration, its consequence is to limit the rise in urea and ammonia concentrations and in other waste products, uh, to limit this rise both in duration and in intensity. Without hyperfiltration, we would have uh, toxic uh, substances staying at higher levels in the blood for longer time. And something that has not been very well appreciated is that high protein diet also increases vasopressin secretion. And there are a few papers. Here I am showing you an example, a study in which, which was done with my participation, where we studied 10 healthy subjects after a protein meal, before in control time and after a protein meal in, for three hours. And these, the same subjects were studied twice. Once they receive a high hydration as is almost always the case in every clinical investigation in order to get good urine output and good urine collection. Uh, so their vasopressin didn't change much after the protein meal. But when the same subjects were studied at a two-week interval with a normal hydration, no excessive water intake, their vasopressin went up. And there are other papers showing vasopressin is higher on pe when people are on a chronic high protein diet. Thus, I'm going to explain you why it is highly likely that vasopressin contributes significantly to the glomerular hyperfiltration that results from high protein intake. We did an experiment in my, life, in my lab uh, many years ago, 20 years ago, where we uh, studied the influence of urine concentration on GFR. So the, the, we used the healthy conscious rats. In some of them, we increased their water intake by mixing their food with a water-rich agar gel. In other rats, we infused DDAVP in order to induce a higher urine osmolality. DDAVP is a selective agonist of the V2 receptors of vasopressin, which are the antidiuretic receptors. And you see that we got very wide differences in urine osmolality going up from about 800 here to 3,000 here. And clearly, the glomerular filtration rate was going up with higher osmolality. This was the only thing here was a change, low vasopressin, of course, in the group that received the high water intake and high vasopressin V2 effects in that group. Uh, they had the same protein diet. They had the same food intake per day because we controlled them. And so obviously, and, and I forgot to say, GFR was measured with a very reali reliable index, which is inulin clearance by infusion of inulin over 24 hours. Uh, moreover, in a longer experiments, uh, more than one week, uh, the kidney gets hypertrophied if uh, urine concentration is increased chronically. So obviously, urine osmolality and vasopressin have an influence on GFR. They induce hyperfiltration. And this is also you, true in humans. It took me a long time to, to convince people to do some experiments in humans. But uh, the, this Italian group did an experiment in which they studied the same healthy subjects on a low or a high hydration at, the, again, a two-week interval. And in every subject, the GFR was higher when they had a low hydration. And if the authors plotted 
the data of the low hydration condition versus urine osmolality, you see a nice correlation, exactly similar to what we had in rats. So also in humans, when urine tends to be more concentrated, the GFR goes up. But we should be cautious because if urine gets diluted compared to plasma, that is if urine becomes less concentrated than the plasma, the correlation does not hold anymore. And uh, so these white points are those obtained on the high hydration condition. And uh, there is no correlation in the range of hypotonic urine. And we had also observed that in rats, but could not publish it because we had too few points and it was not clear enough. But this is also occurring in rats. Uh, if you want to know more about that, which is, uh, in my view, very important, this relationship of urine concentration and uh, uh, GFR holds only in the range of urine concentration, not urine dilution. So you can read this review in which we address this issue. Uh, so how does this relate to CKD? Um, in the last five years, there has been several epidemiologic studies in human courts which revealed significant relationships between the vasopressin hydration system and adverse effects on kidney function. But uh, in the, these studies, vasopressin was not measured. It's a very difficult uh, measurement, the measurement of vasopressin. Uh, the concentration of vasopressin is, uh, in the blood is so low that most uh, immunoassays, even the best ones, those of Dr. Bichet, <laughs> uh, cannot detect the uh, functional levels of vasopressin that are in a normal situation. So the influence of vasopressin in these epidemiologic studies was usually measured indirectly, was evaluated indirectly by looking at either the water intake, the urine volume, urine osmolality, or plasma copeptin concentration. Copeptin is uh, part of the pre-pro-vasopressin molecule, and it is released in the blood in the same in equimolar amounts to vasopressin, but it has a longer half-life and is easier to measure, uh, has a higher molecular weight, and uh, the plasma levels are higher because it stays in the plasma longer. So it's not a stable, many people say copeptin is a stable surrogate of vasopressin. It is degraded, it disappears from the blood, but more slowly than vasopressin. So I'm going to show you three examples of these epidemiologic studies. The first one is in a general population and is based on 24-hour urine volume collections. Uh, by, it was performed by William K. Clark in Canada. He followed this general population for almost six years, and the decline in renal function, which is shown here in a positive way, the decline in renal function over these six years was very small in people who had three liters per day of urine and was much higher in those who had less than one liter of urine per day. So clearly, and these results were adjusted for all the possible confounding factors, including, of course, baseline, uh, GFR, and other factors. So people who have a high urine flow rate tend to have a lesser decline of renal function with age in a general population. The second example is in a population of uh, patients with chronic kidney disease, and the factor that the authors considered is the urine osmolality. osmolarity. Um, they analyzed the cumulative incidence the, of um, end-stage renal disease characterized by uh, initiation of dialysis. And the follow-up of the study was seven years. And after adjusting, of course, for the baseline GFR, because all patients were not at the same level of GFR when they started, they, these authors observed that the patient who had a low urine osmolality had a much lesser incidence of, ES, of uh, initiation of dialysis than those who had started the study with a higher osmolality. 
So again, low osmolality, which probably goes with higher urine volume, seems to uh, be associated with less severe progression of kidney disease. And the third example is in diabetic patients. Uh, this is a, a study from, I forgot to say, the preceding studies from uh, Austria. And this one is from France. I am co-author in their study. Uh, more than 3,000 participants with type 2 diabetes and already showing some albuminuria, which means their kidneys was already suffering to some extent, but their GFR was not decreased. And the uh, copeptin was measured in these people and the, was uh, classified into three tertiles of increasing uh, amount. So the people who had a higher copeptin level at the baseline at the beginning of the study, um, after a follow-up of six years, they had a greater decline in GFR over the six years. And if you consider only those who had not just albuminuria, but macroalbuminuria, macro the, the correlation with copeptin is even stronger. And in these macroalbuminuric pa pa patients at the beginning, the, um, uh, the time when they remained event-free, the, ev the renal events were either doubling of, ser of serum creatinine or initiation of dialysis. And the people who had a low copeptin had much less of these renal events than the people who had a high copeptin level. Okay, so these association studies suggest that high vasopressin, low urine flow rate, uh, high urine osmolality, uh, may, be, uh, may have adverse effect, but they cannot prove causality. Actually, causality uh, is probably the case because animal studies showed, and even also a few uh, human studies, showed that when you manipulate deliberately the vasopressin fluid intake axis, you get similar results. Here we did an experiment that was 25 years ago. And I had good reasons to start this experiment. I assumed already that uh, concentrating urine was a burden for the kidney. So we did, we created a chronic kidney disease in rats by the well-known 5-6 nephrectomy model. And in half of the rats, we gave an excess water in the food so that they would reduce their urine osmolality about threefold, there was a threefold increase in water intake. And of course, vasopressin was reduced. Um, the, we measured vasopressin, actually Daniel Bichet measured vasopressin and the difference was not significant because the measurements are extremely difficult and uh, the, different, the, the variability from an animal to another was high, but there was a much lower vasopressin level in that group. Uh, note that we did not go beyond, below the plasma level. The osmolality of the urine remained close to, but above the plasma level. And this additional water in rats with 5, 6 nephrectomy ameliorated the proteinuria, the blood pressure, the glomerulosclerosis, mortality, which is not shown here, uh, in these rats. So we were able to protect against progressive renal damage, at least to reduce the uh, progression by just increasing water intake. Now, with urine albumin excretion, we have observed in rats, not shown on that slide, that acute injection of DDAVP, this V2 agonist of vasopressin, or Chronic infusion for one week of DDAVP was inducing a very significant rise in urine albumin excretion. And so we were able to reanalyze urines that had been collected by Daniel Bichet and in which he, he had been giving to healthy subjects a DDAVP infusion during 20 minutes. And in, this, in these subjects, it was clear that albumin 
excretion went up. And in some subjects of the same study, studied simultaneously at the same time by Daniel Bichet, but we, who had V2 receptor mutations, which, and they had nephrogenic diabetes insipidus, so they could not respond to vasopressin. There was no rise in albuminuria in these subjects. This is published about 12 years ago. And um, we then did an experiment about at the same time. We did an experiment in rats in which we induced diabetes mellitus with streptozotocin. And in these rats, half of them, instead of giving them more water to drink, because vasopressin antagonist had become available, we gave a vasopressin antagonist to reduce urinosmolality to about 400 compared to 1,000 in the control rats. And you see that the rise, the, the rise in urine albumin excretion observed in the control rats did not occur in the treated rats. So the V2 antagonist protected these uh, diabetic rats from, di from uh, albuminuria. So water conservation under the influence of vasopressin has a price to pay. You have just seen all the slides. There is some hyperfiltration, some increased albuminuria, a rise in blood pressure that I had no time to show you. And uh, there is an increase in vasopressin secretion in, after a high protein intake, I showed that to you, uh, during diabetes mellitus, several papers show that vasopressin is elevated in this disease. In salt-sensitive hypertension, there is uh, several reports also showing an increase, at least in animal studies, less uh, or none in humans, I think. And also strenuous work in a hot climate, of course, makes vasopressin go up. So I think all what I've shown you has some relevance to the uh, Mesoamerican or Sri Lankan or uh, tropical uh, nephropathy, except that I was puzzled when, uh, uh, for, with the first talk that there is no albuminuria in the patients in, uh, in uh, the Mesoamerican area, whereas there is some albuminuria. Okay, yeah. So that's maybe a difference, but obviously there, it's multifactorial. And I'm not saying that vasopressin is the only factor responsible for these tropical nephropathies, but certainly it may have an influence because I assume that the patients who, uh, the, the subjects that work in the sugar cane must have very high vasopressin levels. So the, the importance of water conservation and of course of vasopressin in evolution can be analyzed in the following way. When we have a serious lack of water and a dehydration, this can become life-threatening in just a few days. It is, uh, many children die from dehydration or even uh, older people. Dehydration is extremely life-threatening. Whereas the, if you have a good adaptation to water conservation, it may lead to a decline in kidney function and to hypertension, but these are long-term consequences that don't have time to manifest in the early uh, years, except as we have seen when there are some, probably some additional factors. And evolu evolution has favored water conservation because the long-term consequences do not exert any pressure on natural selection. The, it, these events, these adverse events usually may occur after the years when uh, humans have their babies. So the pressure uh, for sele natural selection has not been f uh, preventing this uh, good water conservation. Uh, what is the mechanism of the um, vasopressin increase in GFR? It's certainly depending on V2 receptors, as I've shown, but there are no V2 receptors in the glomeruli. And it most probably involves vasopressin-dependent urea movements in the kidney. This is just a hypothesis. It is not proven, and it will be difficult to prove. This slide you need to look at from the bottom. Here in the medulla, there are urea transporters that are vasopressin-sensitive. They let urea diffuse out of the collecting duct 
enter in the papilla, and then urea gets a complex uh, circuit in the kidney, which leads more urea to reach the macula densa. And then this seems to, this doesn't seem, there, there are some micropuncture studies showing that it lowers the concentration of sodium at the macula densa, and thus in, reduces the feedback inhibition of GFR. So GFR can go up. Okay, this is a hypothesis we have proposed in our papers, but it's not sure, and it's certainly not the only hypothesis. And I want to stress that this mechanism is different from that responsible for the adverse effect of vasopressin in autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease. In that case, the V2 action of vasopressin on the collecting duct directly promotes cyst growth by inducing a rise in the second messenger cyclic AMP in the cell. So this is a direct mechanism on the tubule where the cyst develop. But the two mechanisms are most likely additive in ADPKD patients. And there are two possible strategies to reduce vasopressin's action, either a voluntary increase in water intake or a treatment with a V2 antagonist. And they don't have exactly the same consequences because the, the rise in water intake will reduce plasma osmolality and reduce vasopressin secretion thus reducing also the effects of, on V1A and, V2, uh, and V1B receptors. Whereas the V2 antagonist, uh, by inducing a loss of water, will increase the osmolality of the plasma, increase vasopressin secretion, and possibly increase the V1A and V2, and, excuse me, V1A and V1B <laughs> receptor actions, but uh, this may not be so harmful as is usually assumed. If you read the reviews I wrote, uh, you may see why. And of course, there might be some adverse effects with the drug which are not present. So my last slide will just tell you that not only a low nephron number, as was beautifully shown by Dr. Brenner in his talk uh, two days ago, uh, not only high protein intake, but also just high AVP, high vasopressin secretion, which is important for water economy, may lead to this vicious circle and may be responsible for some acceleration of renal damage, especially even more if there is a primary renal disease. So thank you for your attention. Um, if, if you want to learn more, there is a review published in Nature Reviews Nephrology in which there is most, not all, but most of what I've told you today. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Liz. Uh, questions for Dr. Bankir? Um, is it you know, totally another area of looking at the CKD progression? But um, um, we see a lot of people with uh, hyponatremia uh, in CKD patient also, especially with our constant um, urging them to cut back on their salt and cut back on their protein. And now we are going to say, you know, ISN has picked up this um, theme of increased water intake. And, no, no. One should really uh, be careful not to increase water intake in cases where it might be uh, also detrimental. There are situations during which I would not recommend increasing water intake. What I'm saying before ISN take up this Excellent. theme as a, as, a, as, a, as a general, you know, the uh, World Kidney Day thing, should not we have done a control trial of increasing water intake to a certain extent, what really works in the real world? Well, this is yeah. interesting. If I may uh, help here, yeah. uh, I think Dr. Bill Clark, that you uh, may have seen a slide, is doing that type of trial. That means that to study high versus low water intake and to see all the other factors being equal if there is some retardation of chronic kidney disease components in a selected population. So the study is done for the moment. It's in progress. 
Yes. Not yet uh, finished. It will uh, be finished in, 19, uh, in 2016. Adam from Alexandria, Egypt. Actually, my point is exactly the same. The ice and use drinking water is helpful. My patient, do we have any clinical evidence to support this? Drinking a cup of water or any fluid, how much for a person with a normal kidney function with CKD 1, 2, 3? I don't think we have an evidence. And my patients and my junior doctor asked me and I failed. I wonder if one of the panel or the speaker can help me. The extrapolation of vasopressin, uh, maybe you are the expert, but I will give you two examples. For example, I have many examples. I believe that this is a physiological feedback, exactly like angiotensin, the bad guy, which if the patient in shock, angiotensin will definitely increase, and it must be increased because it is beneficial. Oliguria in a patient with a normal kidney, if he's dehydrated, the kidney is good because it conserves water to help the body. And this is not injurious. And on the other hand, hyperfiltration in a pregnant woman is not injurious. It depends on multifactorial. But I come back to my main question because I really fail. Do we have any clinical evidence? Because the ISN is a big entity and put this in front of all the people and I'm in front of my patient. So if anybody can help me in getting this evidence. Uh, okay. let, me, let me speak a little bit about this because this has been extensively discussed at ISN. The drinking a glass of water, that's the motto that's used by the World Kidney Day, and that is IFKF in conjunction with ISN, is not intended to say that there's any scientific proof whatsoever. And this has been explicitly said and it's uh, disclosed. And if it's not clear, I would like to make it very clear because it has been used like a uh, um, starting point where we get together and spark the idea of the importance of the World Kidney Day. It has not been uh, promoted in any way as something that has in itself, as of today, enough evidence to prove that drinking this amount or that amount of water will make a difference. We all know that we're made of water and that if we dehydrate, kidneys fail. That is a fact, and we cannot, we cannot challenge that. The amount of water we have to take, one liter, one liter and a half, two liters, the relation between water and ambient temperature and how much we have to drink according to the amount of temperature, the activities we do. We do not know that really. But uh, so it's mostly that the concept and not, and not a scientific statement that proves that uh, drinking one glass of water w w will make a change. Actually, the statement is not drink a lot of water to cure your kidneys. Just drink a glass of water to start uh, a camp a campaign to make the general public look towards the kidney. The world knows very well World uh, Heart Day, Women's Day, and a bunch of days, so we needed uh, something that would spark and start World Kidney Day to be looked at as something important. But I get your point. I get your yeah. point. But we are a scientific uh, organization, yeah. so we yeah, but World Kidney Wait. Day is not only ISN. World Kidney Day is an event that wants to put into the public the importance of taking care of kidneys. Yeah, I would like to add something uh, to what you said. The, the field is poorly known because not many people were interested in uh, investigating the role of uh, vasopressin or urine concentration in uh, kidney health or kidney disease. Vasopressin was difficult to measure. Very few studies used 24-hour urine collection to know. Does a doctor ask his patients, do you pass one liter per day or three liters per day? Nobody knows. It's not in most records except in certain studies. And you have seen one of my slides where I showed that most st clinical investigations are performed with a high water load just to get good urine collection. But then if vasopressin has a role to play in whatever is studied there, it will not be visible. So we have to raise the interest for the next 10 years 
in vasopressin so as to become more aware of the problems and possibly propose some solutions. Thank you, Liz. Uh, I'm afraid we should move, yeah. and, um, but uh, you know, uh, definitely uh, uh, we could continue those types of con conversation at the end of the session. We still have uh, one presentation concerning uh, the occupational risk factors for chronic kidney disease in, uh, in Andhra Pradesh, uh, which is called Udanam Nephropathy, and uh, this poster uh, short communication is supposed to be uh, presented uh, by Dr. Youssef Farag. Aha. Oh. So, so nobody came. Uh, I see. So uh, no, no, nobody came. I'm, I'm sorry. So Dr. Youssef Farag is not here. No. So, so, so that maybe if you would bear with me, I would like to make some comments concerning temperature and vasopressin. And because um, the way that we are perceiving osmolality is through some special cells that we call osmoreceptors that we have in the brain. And these osmoreceptors perceive osmolality through trips, that is 